All right, folks, let's talk about the Trident. Iconic weapon and symbol, fairly common in fantasy, not so much in history necessarily, but let's take a look at what there is. First, I'm going to talk about the functionality of the design with its pros and cons, and then we'll look at some historical examples. But first, let me dislodge my lower back from this trident. Thanks, buddy. A functional trident can be related to either one of two types of tools, the pitchfork or the fishing spear. And on the Great Ming military block spot, there is an interesting typology of Chinese three-pronged pole arms from a wooden rake over here to a metal form with blade-like tines and a spear point. And then the next type still has this vestigial tine design, which harkens back to uh, the earlier rake. Well, hopefully I won't make any serious mistakes in this video, otherwise the torches and pitchforks might come out in the comments. Although lucky for me, many agricultural pitchforks make for rather lousy weapons. Uh, many of them tend to have thin, flexible tines, which are just too flimsy to fight with. Although, to be fair, there are also more solid ones. You know, this here looks sturdy enough that you could possibly use it as an improvised weapon. Even though this wooden pitchfork wouldn't make for a great weapon, it looks pretty cool. I just have to point it out. It's, there's something about it aesthetically. And perhaps if you turn it into steel blades and modified it a little bit, it would probably be pretty decent. Anyway, so then we've got the fishing tool as well. This right here is a Viking harpoon. And uh, you've got the barbs right here, which have a functional purpose for catching fish, obviously. There is also this right here, if you want twice the tines. And basically, the more tines you have, the better chance you have of entangling a fish in it, or also the more hooks or barbs. Uh, this is an interesting harpoon type made by First Nations people in North America. So what should a combat trident not look like? Well, basically like this. Uh, these hooks or barbs would be great for fishing, but in a fight against a human, not so good in my opinion. So the main problem is the risk of getting stuck. You know, imagine you deliver a thrust uh, to the torso and you know it penetrates into the ribcage and then the hooks on the way out can easily catch on bone you know on a rib uh, or even on cloth uh, as in fact have you ever gotten a fishing hook stuck in clothing while something like this would of course be dangerous and hurt an enemy it may go in but there is a risk it might not come out. And particularly if you're dealing with multiple attackers, if your weapon gets stuck in one, or if the one uh, opponent is still able to fight back, but you cannot dislodge the weapon, you're in a world of hurt, potentially. So this is really better for arrows or javelins. Now there is the idea that hooked or barbed blades are particularly cruel and intimidating because they threaten to disembowel the enemy. Well, sure, if you were to fight someone who's naked or at least doesn't have any clothing or armor on the abdomen, sure, that would be very nasty. But that's a very specific situation and the risk outweighs any form of benefit you would get from that, in my opinion. Now, I found this vicious looking trident from Africa which has lots of small barbs. Unfortunately, there was no info about it, so I don't know if this was intended as a weapon or a hunting or fishing tool. Quite possible that it's that. Um, with smaller hooks or barbs, I see less of an issue with it. It's not quite as likely to get really lodged on bone or, or armor or other material, but it could very much still snag on sturdy clothing and be stopped, or at least you would, it would stop the withdrawal. So 
Either way, it seems risky to me. For a kind of hero who doesn't want to kill, this design could be good still. It could be intended for immobilization. There's actually an interesting example in Shira. Mermista's trident is this sort of design. It's better for defensive use, it's better for controlling the opponent, in which he does here, you know, jams the weapon into the ground. So this way you can you can parry better, you can redirect the opponent's weapon. It's not as good at thrusting, because this kind of design wouldn't penetrate very far, and in fact, hers doesn't. So the way it's shown there is surprisingly realistic. These things are taking the concept further. The Sasumata and Sodagarami, which are Japanese forms of man-catcher. So you've got all of these hooks and barbs that are supposed to be thrust into the opponent's clothing, not to try to hurt them seriously, but just kind of put it against the clothing and then twist to bunch it up and control it. Uh, this one can either have the spike in the middle or not. Sometimes it's, it's just a fork without the center spike. And uh, so this is, this is a way to push someone down and uh, immobilize them to be able to arrest them. There is also a modern version used by law enforcement. Exact same idea. There's another way to reduce a trident's combat effectiveness, which is with strongly curved ends like this. This one here is actually a ceremonial trident carried during parades. And uh, you can tell that it's not really a functional fighting design because the way these are curved, you know, as soon as, if you try to use this, as soon as the center spike or blade starts to penetrate, it would only get until about here because then those would hit, would hit the body or other target and then stop it because this is not a proper angle. With this kind of curvature, in order for them to penetrate, the thrust would have to go in the direction of the point. It would have to be aligned with it. When I think about the pros and cons of a trident as a weapon in general, a few things come to mind. One, yeah, you can stab them three times at once, basically. Um, you can see that positively and negatively. Um, this depends on how much you want to overanalyze it. Because I used to be skeptical of this kind of design, thinking that you're spreading out the force. You know, instead of concentrating all the force on a single point, you know, the smaller the surface, the more you maximize the energy you're putting into it. Hypothetically, each of the blades or spikes or tines transmits less force than a single one would. How much of a difference does it make in practical terms? I'm really not sure. If you were to devise a really good control test, you may find that it's not really that much of a difference. Plus, even if the penetration is less for each one, you're now inflicting three wounds instead of one. Uh, the drawback of that is also three times the risk to get stuck or hit hard areas, you know, like armor or particularly dense bone. If just one of the three gets stopped, then the others are not really going to get any further or not much further. I mean, they're going to shift a little bit. The angle is going to change, but it's thrown off now. The other main benefit is, of course, that it can catch an enemy weapon. If a blade goes in between two of those blades or spikes, then you can twist it and, and control it. The other drawback I can think of on a conceptual basis is that compared to a single bladed pole arm, making a trident would either add weight or make individual blades or spikes weaker. Because if you think about it, if you use the exact same amount of material and you turn it either into a spear or a trident, the spear is going to be more solid, of course, than each individual tine or blade. Anyway, enough overthinking. Let's just move on to examples of actual fighting designs. The oldest one I could find is between 4,000 and 3,500 years old, made of bronze. And this is interpreted as a weapon as opposed to a tool because of the design. 
which I agree with. Because for one, the um, tines are look pretty solid. I think they're sturdy enough to fight with. Also the size, this is relatively compact. Not sure how useful that would be as a pitchfork and it doesn't have any barbs or hooks. The most iconic example of course, is from Rome in the hands of a Reciarius, which is a gladiator type pitted against the armored Secutor, sometimes the Schisser as well. So this gladiator is wielding a trident called a Fuscina or Tridens, I think is how you pronounce it, a dagger and a weighted net. So you have fisherman symbolism here, which is intentional. This one right here looks like it's got small barbs, although it could also be reinforced tips. Remember we talked about barbs before and how they don't make for a good weapon. With this you have to keep in mind they stylized the equipment. It wasn't military gear that was supposed to be as efficient as possible. This was a spectacle. You were supposed to give the audience a show. So it didn't have to be the absolute most effective thing ever. It just had to look good and it had to kind of be either balanced or deliberately imbalanced, depending on what you're going for. It's all about the entertainment. This, on the other hand, is a rather sturdy looking Fuskina. It's got fairly wide tines and strong points. So this makes plenty of sense. Um, this bronze version here is a more curved form and makes me wonder, is this a practice version perhaps? Or was this a non-lethal alternative? Because in the arena you don't always want to have the gladiators killed. In fact, more often than not you really don't because if you put resources into training gladiators and feeding them, uh, and also considering that they weren't all slaves, there were plenty of uh, citizens who actually voluntarily became a gladiator as you know, a career choice, basically. This could make some sense, but I don't know for sure. Moving on to China, like I mentioned, there are a number of three-pronged Chinese pole arms, like the Tang Pa and others. Uh, it comes in a variety of different forms. There are some unusual looking shapes. This jagged shape would again make sense for entrapping and controlling and of course the entire design is suitable for that. Then there's a tiger fork which was likely originally designed for hunting and fighting off tigers, hence the name. Uh, back then wild animals were a significant threat and you certainly wanted to keep tigers away from the village. So this design here, this is not a blade, it doesn't have edges, these are all rounded. And so there's more space here. I'm assuming the idea is you really want to make sure that you catch the tiger. You don't want to thrust at it and miss and then have a charge at you and your, you know, cat food. Uh, this could be useful in that regard if you impale the tiger with the center one the other two also hold on to it even if you, if it's a narrow miss then you might still get it with one of the other two so again the same principle as we've seen before you know being able to control pin down uh, particularly with multiple hunters here's a vietnamese trident same kind of deal these are blades again with edges so you've got the two side blades and the center one. These are almost the same length, but the center is a little bit longer. What if your three-pronged spear has another two prongs on each prong? I guess someone was running a prongathon. This is a Burmese trident from the 18th century. I couldn't find any information about it, unfortunately. So I don't know if this was designed as a weapon or if it was ceremonial, considering how richly decorated it is. That's a possibility, but don't know for sure. And uh, at the bottom, we've got a Korean iron trident. Again, no info about it, but this looks more utilitarian, I suppose. Here it is, together with some other pole arms from the area. And then we've got Indo-Persian pole arms on the right this is from the 18th century. 
is made of iron and uh, is chisel decorated and has this ornamental painted haft. Again, it's unsure if that's ceremonial or not. I don't want to jump to conclusions and call everything ceremonial, but sometimes that is what it is. There are plenty of weapons or weapon-like objects in museums that were never intended to be fought with. Uh, but on the other hand, you've got basically the exact same design over here, but in a more pragmatic looking form. What I find a little odd about these is the shape. So here we've got that problem again, the way these side blades are shaped. I, I'm pretty sure they would interfere with the effectiveness of a thrust because the center one is perfectly aligned with the half. So, you know, as you thrust, everything is, you know, the, the, the force goes where it's supposed to basically. But then it's just kind of diverted outward. So these two would not penetrate as well as the center one. The force of the push goes forward, but then those two will want to kind of spread outward. You know, if they hit something and they encounter a lot of resistance, they could be forced apart a little bit. In case of iron, that would simply cause those blades to be bent and stay bent. If you have spring-tempered steel, they could flex apart and then return to their original shape. Overthinking again. Anyway, moving on. So now we're looking at weapons that are somewhat less trident-like. Uh, these are various Japanese Yari spears. Uh, this one, the first one on the top left, this could be called a form of trident. The others, not so much. Uh, you could argue that a quote-unquote true trident has all points being useful for stabbing forward. Uh, that's the case here. Uh, not so much with these. These, I think, would be more useful for hooking and possibly slashing rather than thrusting straight forward. In medieval and Renaissance Europe, you have different kinds of trident-like shapes. Here's a French military fork. Uh, in general, you have lots of military forks in the Renaissance and onward. Now, here's another example. So here you've got a pretty long central blade or spike and then two shorter side ones. These can be straight or curved. They can be uh, curved upward or downward. There's a lot of variation really. And some of them are two pronged. That's what you'd call a bident. I uh, wish I could hear the groans. Anyway, there are plenty of examples from Italy. There's an odd type on the top left. Again, similar to the Indo-Persian ones. This again I find pretty strange, considering that this is not aligned with the direction of the thrust, but they thought it was a good idea anyway. And uh, on these bidens you also have hooks. So they can be either on the side or they can stick out the front like that. Designs like that are again optimized for controlling the opponent's weapon if you don't want to let them off the hook. This one is extra hooky, technical term. So you've got downward curved hooks and one that's swept upward. And it can be useful in many ways. You know, pulling a cavalryman off the horse, uh, wrenching shields or opposing pole arms, pulling on clothing or armor, hooking ankles, etc., etc. Then there's the corsac, which is sort of an inverted trident, if you will. The uh, name comes from the Mediterranean island Corsica. Uh, there are some types of corsac that have side blades reminiscent of bat wings. If you want to call that a bat sec? Never mind, that sounds too much like bat sack. We don't want that. Here's another one of that type. And also a reminder that History sometimes looks pretty fantasy. It's not always simple, uh, conventional design. Sometimes they went kind of wild. There's also the Speedum and Ranceur, which I can't, can barely even distinguish. They all look pretty similar, really. And then we've got a military fork 
that, oddly enough, is angled like a pitchfork. You can see that right here, which, again, I wouldn't really expect normally. This is not necessarily an angle that you need. Well, unless it is really designed for either upward or downward thrusts, could be useful in some situations, I suppose. Then we've got the uh, Runka. If you speak a Scandinavian language, this is hard to look at with a straight face because Runka means something else. Anyway, again, fairly similar to some of the other types. Another one. This has got two sets of blades, uh, one that curves upward and one that curves downward. So they wanted both clearly, because depending on the curvature, you have different benefits. I don't have one of those pole arms. The closest I have is this uh, halberd trainer here, but still enough to demonstrate. So if it's curved downward, you can hook with it quite well, obviously. So you can control the opponent's blade. It's not going to slide off, but if you try to catch an opponent's blade like this, then this is much more likely to glance off and come at you anyway. So why not both? This way you can hook with the, the bottom part and you can still control, you know, catch an opponent's blade in this corner right here and use that and you can also thrust with these points at a different angle. Uh, that's probably also something that I should have mentioned earlier when talking about the different, um, you know, curved or otherwise, quote unquote, misaligned blades. They may be misaligned for a straight thrust, but there are ways to change the direction to an extent, of course. Say this was an elongated blade and I wanted to thrust with it, I wouldn't do it like this, of course. Wow, that's a weird perspective, isn't it? I would rather try it, you know, more like that. I saved the most interesting, unique type for last, the brandy stock, uh, AKA feather staff, used between the 16th and 19th century. These are retractable blades that are stored inside the haft. Apparently they snap forward and lock into place with a sharp forward motion. So it's somewhat like a gravity knife. I gotta say, I would love to have a functional reproduction of one of these because it's just cool. It would be really fun to mess around with. It's not as solid of a design, uh, literally. You know, anytime you add uh, separate moving parts and a lock, you're asking for trouble that you wouldn't otherwise encounter with a solid pole arm because now there's additional risk of failure, you know, smaller parts breaking, the lock failing, things like that. But it's pretty neat. I <laughs> can't argue with that. It's a very interesting concept for sure. If that's not crazy enough for you, how about a fork halberd wheel lock gun combination. If you can't decide if you want to, you know, chop them or stab them or shoot them, there you go. You got it all. And that's all I've got. Hope you found it interesting. Again, links down below. Thanks for watching and have a good one, folks. Because of the design, stop glitching green screen. It's not nice. You know, if you look at it, oh, that's why. Give me a second. Oh my goodness, this is stupid. How do I get rid of this? Ah, fuck off here.